All right, Boz, here we go. This is, I guess we could say, the third installment of a, what we didn't know might become a bit of a series, and yeah. that's diving into the What is Fitness uh, across a journal article that was written back in 2002, October, by yeah. Greg Glassman. On episode 32 of Very Not Random, we covered the 10 general physical skills. On episode 34, we covered the hopper. That was model one and model two of you know, CrossFit's multiple models that are articulated in the What is Fitness article. And today, we're diving into the third that is the metabolic pathways. Love it. Yep, the metabolic pathways. This is the model that kind of takes these ideas that are put forward in the first two tries to ground them in some physiology and uh, you know some scientific basis. But really, in my opinion, it's just another way to look at the themes that have already been explored. And I think sometimes people lose sight of that because it does start to get a little bit more technical and a little bit more academic. Oh, but yeah. That doesn't change the game. That doesn't change the goal. We're generalists. We're trying to develop a broad range of physical capacities. That's what we think fitness really is. Um, and it's just another way to start expressing that concept. So don't get lost behind the terminology. Don't think that because there are more technical sounding terms or, uh, you know, some, some fancy monosyllabic or oh, geez, some fancy multisyllabic <laughs> words there in there. Go. I can't even get my own words, right? <laughs> uh, that these are going to be beyond your comprehension. If you're not, uh, already steeped in this. It's nothing of the sort. It's just a basic grounding in what the body does when it's exposed to different types of activity. Yes. And so you could geek out on this as much as you wanted to. And for some people, that makes their heart just sing with joy. And, and if you yep. want to, you can go down as deep of a rabbit hole if you want. This could be a full semester in some college if you wanted to. But the interesting thing, and you mentioned it, is None of that is particularly as useful or beneficial, geeking out on it to that degree, as one would think with regards to just understanding the fitness that we're trying to develop in people and how you may want to create workouts and train to get yourself really well-rounded, CrossFit shape, if you will. So these metabolic pathways, just some very simple definitions in case that's confusing to people like, what the heck are you talking about metabolic pathways? So you know, metabolism, I looked it up this morning from the Mayo Clinic, and metabolism is, they just define it as the process by which your body converts what you eat and drink into energy. So we're talking about utilizing energy so that we can do work. The work that we would like to do is functional movements, be it in the gym or outside of the gym. And depending upon the uh, duration of the effort or the intensity of the effort, our, our body just has some various choices to to best serve those needs. So that in general, very simple terms, that's what we're talking about when we're going to discuss the metabolic pathways found in the What is Fitness article. Yeah, exactly. And there's three primary metabolic pathways. You can think about them as kind of different engines that run the machine. And it's not to say that they're going to be running exclusive to one another. In fact, right. most of the time, there's going to be quite an overlap um, depending on the activity that you're engaged in. So you've got to stop thinking about this in a way that is completely cut and dry. Again, you know, we've mentioned this before, nature does not have a distinction to shift gears with such absolute uh, intent. There is going to be a lot of overlap. So anyway, back to the point, there's three of these major metabolic engines, the phosphocreatine or phosphagen pathway, which is responsible for the most intense efforts, the glycolytic pathway, which is kind of the middle ground, if you will. And then the oxidative, which is responsible for efforts that are less intense and usually more drawn out timing wise. And we've got some general times that are associated with these. And, mm -hmm. and these are close enough for government work. You know, they may not be ex <laughs> exactly perfect, but they're, they're going to get your head around where you need to be. In general, that phosphagen or phosphocreatine pathway, they'll say it's efforts maybe lasting up to 30 seconds, 30 seconds and less. That middle one, that lactate, that glycolytic, let's say 30 seconds to 120 seconds, somewhere around there. And then that final one, the oxidative would kind of take over. If it's beyond, if it's 120 seconds and beyond, that's going to be your oxidative, your aerobic pathway. But like you said, it's, it's 
the more you dive into this, it's very rare that you are solely in one pathway operating in right. one at the at the utter and complete exclusion to the others which is why like so many other things with crossfit we are looking to develop all three of these pathways even though we might have some biases as to which ones we feel are a bit more beneficial yeah absolutely and you know when we start talking about those time frames associated with the pathways i think it's also important that that timing really represents a maximum intensity of effort as well. It's not yes. to say that when I'm walking at a casual pace, the first 30 seconds are dominated by the phosphocreatine pathway. That's not the case at all. Right. That has to do really with the effort I'm putting forth. So when you think phosphocreatine pathway in its purest expression, think something like a 100 meter dash or a max effort deadlift, mm -hmm. something that you cannot repeat at the same level of intensity immediately after that initial first. And we've all felt that. I think everybody's done something like that. You know, they've sprinted right. 100 meters or they've sprinted to catch the bus and you know how quickly you run out of gas before you have to wait and kind of recharge and repeat that effort. So that is kind of the pure expression. That's why your 100 meter dash pace is different than your two mile exactly. run pace. You know, it is not uh, yeah. sustainable. We're talking about things yeah. that are not sustainable without, hey, I got to rest. The, the machine's got to recover for a bit before I'm going to even give yep. that a try again because it's so darn hard for sure. Yeah. And so then you go down to the glycolytic and as Pat said, you know, you get about 120 seconds. So if we think about that in terms of intensity, this is not going to be the fastest 100% all out sprint because you'll die out before you ever get to that 120 second of effort or, or beyond that kind of 30 second range. So this represents about a 75, 80% effort. You know, think about an 800 meter run. That's a really great expression of the glycolytic pathway. It's a, it's a fast enough pace that you cannot wait to get over the finish line. Right. Uh, but it's, it's sustainable enough that you can stretch it out just a bit longer than you'd hope for. So it's a really uncomfortable place to train for that reason. It's, it's not so intense that you have to stop right away but it's pretty intense and it doesn't feel good. And consequently, you get a lot of benefit out of that glycolytic. Uh, and it's kind of no coincidence that a lot of CrossFit training is gonna be centered mm -hmm. in that middle ground. And, and we'll talk about why that's so important uh, in, in a little bit here. And again, you might've mentioned it, but again, not sustainable. Yeah, that's right. You're gonna, yep. you're gonna need to give yourself a break that the pace that you can, or the level of intensity or effort that you can give in that glycolytic pathway, it, it burns out all things considered in a relatively short time domain, a couple of minutes there. And that yep. brings us to your favorite, the oxidative <laughs> pathway. <laughs> yes, <Going long>. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so the oxidative pathway, you can almost think about this as the, uh, the background operating system of the human engine. Mm. So if you have a computer, like an old computer running off of DOS or something, you don't really know that it's running in the background, but that's what's holding the whole thing together. That's the oxidative pathway. It's always going to be the default when the body's at rest or when there's not a lot of uh, intensity placed on the body. That's the primary fuel source because it's very efficient. It doesn't take a lot for your body to produce energy this way. The problem is that there's a pretty low threshold before when that demand for energy starts to exceed your capacity to create it through the oxidative system. So after you start increasing the intensity uh, past about 40 to 50% of what your maximum intensity is, your body can't keep up with the demand through the oxidative pathway alone, and it starts to have to rely on some of these other mechanisms. So to ground that in reality, if we're thinking about a longer duration effort, like you're going for a 10 mile run or a hike or something like that, it's gonna be a pace that's sustainable for a long time, that's an oxidative effort. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's rare that you're gonna to get to a point where you're totally out of breath and just like heaving and can't, can't keep up with it if it's in that oxidative range. Yeah, for sure. And we've got some of these as anaerobic, some as aerobic, you know, um... Some of these metabolic pathways are associated with the utilization of energy. Those would be the anabolic ones. And other metabolic pathways are associated with breaking down molecules. And in that process, energy is released. So those are kind of catabolic in nature. But the, the interplay 
which is profoundly complex, like you said, and you're rarely in one. All these pathways, to some degree, they live in this synergistic, harmonious state where they complement one another. And this interplay of some energy, which is released by one, can then be used as to fuel another. So there's there's a lot going on here. Like I said, you can you can nuke it to whatever degree that you want, but believe it or not, it's not. What's funny is I did nuke this, and I don't have it in my brain anymore. But back when I was lecturing. Uh, you know, full time for a living, I always had this fear that I'm going to you know, be delivering the mm -hmm. metabolic pathways and there's going to be a biochemist or somebody sitting in the front row and they're going to try to like, you know, sharpshoot me with this question, you know, and so I'm like, I got to know three, four, five or six layers deeper of the onion just in case that question comes out. And I wish I could get those hours of my life back. I, I put <laughs> so much time and effort into, into that and I was ready for like the oddball pseudo intellectual, you know, I want to catch the lecturer mm -hmm. off guard question, like I got ready for that question. But what was interesting was, in all that studying and reading I did just to be prepared for that, none of the quote, unquote, knowledge that I soaked into my brain affected anything that I did in the garage that night for a workout. Not yeah. a single like all that extra time and effort did not. There wasn't one time that I sat down after a session was like, Oh, wow, I can't believe I just learned that unique, mm -hmm. nuanced piece of information about the metabolic pathways. I'm going to train different tomorrow. It wasn't there. So getting back to what we said, this relatively and basic sounding understanding of some biochemistry that we're giving here is, it's all that you need to understand why CrossFit is a broad, general, inclusive fitness. So with that being said, we touched on three metabolic pathways. How does that relate? You know, why is why are these three pathways one of the multiple fitness standards that CrossFit mentions in the What Is Fitness article? It's an excellent question. And really what it boils down to is the same theme that we've seen before. When we talked about the 10 general physical skills, the goal there was somebody who was well-rounded across all 10 and didn't have a glaring deficiency in any one of them. That's the fittest individual. So the conclusion you could draw was, well, my fitness program should support developing all 10. Pretty straightforward. When we talk about the hopper, we see the same kind of theme. Anything I can throw into the hopper to test myself or a group of athletes is, is on the table. We turn the crank, we pull it out, we do all of these different tests. The person that does the best across the broadest range of tests, also again with no glaring deficiencies, that person is the fittest. It's not mm -hmm. the one that's really good at an, only a single activity. So what can I take away from that? Well, he or she is the fittest that is the best across the board, and therefore my fitness program should support all of these different things and me being competent in them. So when we get to the pathways, it's the same idea. The fitness that we're after should develop all three metabolic pathways. The, the athlete that we're kind of putting on a pedestal is one that has the ability to be explosive. They're perfectly capable at a sprint pace. They're comfortable in that middle ground. And if you strap a backpack to them and have them go, long hike through the woods, they're going to be happy there as well. Well, maybe right. happy is not the right term, but they'll be comfortable <laughs> they do it. competent. Yeah. And so then again, how does that inform our training? Well, we want a fitness program that is going to develop all three of those capacities and not just one at the expense of the others, which really kind of represents a specialty type of training. And, mm -hmm. and to kind of broaden that one more uh, kind of step here, you had mentioned that there's and aerobic and anaerobic side to this. And I think that's important to park on for a second. Typically, back in the day, historically, when people talk about fitness, aerobic fitness was the element that was given primacy. Oh, yeah. If you were aerobically fit, that was all that it really took in the eyes of most people to be considered fit. Well, if we have these three pathways and we say you're really, really great oxidatively, but you're terrible when it starts uh, getting a little bit more intense. Mm -hmm. Can we really look at that person and say that they're fit? Well, probably not if our context is a broad capability. So it's important that we start including this idea of anaerobic training, which means without oxygen or another easy way to think about that is more intensity. Mm -hmm. And the definition then becomes more expanded when we're talking about fitness. It's not good enough for me to just be aerobically fit. I have to be anaerobically fit as well. Right. 
And that comes with a whole host of benefits that a lot of people historically did not really consider as part of the benefits of exercise. So, you know, things like muscle mass, uh, both increase and retention, that's hugely anaerobic uh, in nature. Those, those types of activities that are anaerobic are going to have the biggest benefits there. Bone density, you know, uh, all sorts of these kind of secondary effects that you get from including this anaerobic style training is going to be huge. And that's kind of a paradigm shift that I think in 2021, people just take for granted, but it was a right. pretty radical thing not that long ago. Oh, I, I found it extremely radical. So you're, you're completely correct. Most people, when they would think about aerobic training, going long, oxidative pathway, you're a runner. So you know, if, if you go and do a 40 minute run every day, you must be fit. You know, and mm -hmm. like you said, that you're probably not well-rounded at all. You're probably just very capable actually running the one pace for the distance that you're used to running and not much else. I, that was me. And people generally associated that running, going long, you know, aerobic conditioning with cardiovascular function, decreased body fat, you know, good stuff like that. And I didn't realize that that came at a loss of muscle mass, loss of strength, a loss of power, and that anaerobic training, like you're saying, shorter time domain, but higher intensity, that still provides wonderful cardiorespiratory endurance that I only used to associate with aerobic training. I didn't realize you could get it with anaerobic training and also decrease yeah, body fat. Absolutely. And then all the benefits that you just said right there. And that was one of the things, especially coming from the military, where in the military, you're kind of an involuntary endurance athlete, whether you want to be or not. At least back mm. when I was in, everything was long running long, swimming long, but we're going long, long and slow. That when I first started doing CrossFit workouts back in 05, I remember looking at the website and I'm used to running long, you know, four or five times a week. And I'm like, I would see run a 5k on CrossFit.com maybe once every 12 weeks, maybe. And I was like, what? I'm going to fall quote unquote out of shape so mm. fast. It's going to be crazy. Yeah, there'd be some 400s every now and then in something like Helen or there's this Nancy workout, whoop de do, but that's not going to cut it. 400 meters is laughable. Well, then, of course, I poured my heart and soul into it and, and went headlong into CrossFit. And then every now and then when that run of 5K would come up and I'd look at my watch, I was shocked that I was right around my old times without training it. And at the time, I just thought it was witchcraft and magic, you know, and I, I, cause I didn't, I didn't realize. I mean, it still kind of is. But. Yeah, it still kind of is. I didn't realize the benefits of anaerobic training that I was now doing more regularly still lended themselves to having capacity in the anaerobic, excuse me, in the aerobic realm, but the opposite is not true. If you spend most yeah. of your time in the aerobic world, you can't suddenly start crushing anaerobic activity. So one gives you a, a lot more breadth and depth of your fitness than the other. And that is why, while we do want, we're greedy, right? We want capacity in, in all three. If we had to say, you know, well, what's your favorite? We're going to lean towards the anaerobic side of the house. Absolutely. And, and that, I think there's one really important thing that you snuck in there that needs to just be parked on for a minute. And that is the fact that anaerobic training can support aerobic development, mm -hmm. but not the other way around. That's hugely important. And if you look at the guidelines that most countries put out for you know, the average citizen uh, as far as what they should be doing for activity, it's almost exclusively centered around aerobic activity. And it right. completely misses the point that that will not fully develop the individual. And I'll take that a step further. You, know, you and I talk about this a lot as being kind of more seasoned CrossFitters at this point, meaning we've been doing this for a while, we're getting old. And, we made and plenty of mistakes. That's right. Well, not even that, but I think our eyes are on the next 10, 20, 30 oh, right, years sure. now, not just how's my performance going to be next week. And so when you start to view things in that lens, as you age, holding on to anaerobic capacity is going to be a much harder challenge than holding on to aerobic capacity. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to fall off most significantly, your strength, your ability to be explosive, those types of qualities diminish faster as you age. And they will especially diminish much faster if you've never trained them to begin with or if you don't train them regularly. So it's one more thing to kind of focus on as you're thinking forward 
So you've got to get both sides of the house in order. So that being said, we mentioned it earlier, the glycolytic pathway kind of has this bridging effect between the very short and the long efforts. And that's why it usually serves as the, the home base for many CrossFit workouts. If you have somebody who's kind of developed in the middle, they can be explosive and lift heavy and you know run fast, all that kind of stuff. And they can stretch those efforts out 10, 20, 30, mm -hmm. an hour, two hours long. They might not be their favorite thing to do, but they certainly have the capacity to do it. So that's why you see these kind of two to 20 minute efforts be the, the real ground zero for a lot of CrossFit training. And I'm going to leave it to you to kind of break down how even within like a longer quote unquote CrossFit effort, a 20 minute or 30 minute, as many rounds as possible style effort, why that's still glycolytic and why it doesn't spill over into the oxidative and how that can be kind of seen as an interval training effort. Yeah. So interval training, or, you know, we just mentioned previously that something in the glycolytic realm is not sustainable. So you would therefore think, well, I'm doing a, and if the glycolytic ends around 120 seconds, well, then if I'm doing anything three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever many minutes, I must now be doing long, slow, oxidative, aerobic mm -hmm. training. But I think a lot of what we do in CrossFit is sneaky and it's beautiful and that there's some elegance in there and you're doing, for lack of a better way to say it, interval training at an unsustainable pace with work to rest intervals built in, but you don't even realize it. If, if we think of a classic and beloved workout like DT, hero workout, everybody loves DT, 155 in the bar for the gentlemen, 105 for the women, five rounds for time, 12 deads, nine hang power cleans, six push jerks or shoulder overhead. If you just took somebody with a PVC pipe and had them do one round of DT, you know, not like a, a, a spastic lunatic, but you know, at a good, <laughs> a good, aggressive, but sustainable pace with the PVC pipe, and you timed it, then you just multiplied it by five because there's five rounds. The actual amount of moving, if you were a cyborg that didn't get tired, DT would take <laughs> you about four minutes, low fours, 415, something like that. Well, now if you look at like even the data on BTWB, you type in DT and you see the 80th percentile, which means you're pretty the, darn you know, good. There's effort. only, yeah, there's only 20% of people out there are faster than you. The top 80% is amazing. Yeah. The times on average for men and women come out to about low eight minutes. So literally double what the cyborg would take. Well, what's happening there? Well, what's happening is that you're resting. You know, the amount of time it takes to do DT, if you didn't stop, is still low fours, but it takes somebody in the 80th percentile, which by the way, most of us are not in the 80th percentile. <laughs> so so the, 80th, the 80th percentile <laughs> is actually doing a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio, just based upon the amount of work they have to do, how long it actually takes to do the work, and then how long it's really taking them to do the work. It's sneaky interval training. And then if you are slower than that, which most of us are, you're actually doing an even longer work to rest mm -hmm. ratio because the effort is so darn challenging. So even something like that, you know, people might associate interval training with just 10 by 100 meter sprints. We're going to do one every two minutes. Okay, I, I see that plain as day interval training. But a lot of the stuff that we do is by its very nature, not sustainable. That's why the barbell's mm -hmm. on the ground, your hands are on your hips, and you're hyperventilating for a little bit before you pick it back up. If it was sustainable, you never would have put that thing down. You never would have come off the pull-up bar. You would, you would keep that pace on the bike, whatever it happens to be. And so I think that is kind of the hidden beauty of CrossFit that at first glance to the uninitiated develops a lot of sneaky fitness in ways that is, that is confusing to the uninitiated. Yeah, absolutely. And so knowing all of this, I think it can be, what's the word? Seductive? Yes. To believe that, okay, I'm armed with a little bit of knowledge now. I need to really be specific about targeting these different pathways, or I have to fundamentally change the way that I'm approaching my fitness. And that's usually not the case. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not the case that you're going to want to think about these in such linear terms. Okay, I have to go short, and then I also have to go long, and I have to go purely medium. No, that's not what it's about. The, the understanding of these different engines 
is there to promote the idea that we want a mixed mode of training, a mixed time domain of training, so that we do develop all three through that process, not so that we drop everything and try to exactly target all three, because that's going to be a fool's Agreed. errand at the end of the day Agreed. if we're truly interested in a generalist approach. Yes. If all I'm interested in is the heaviest lift I can do or the fastest 100 meter dash, okay, that makes sense. Drop everything and, and really try to focus on that one pathway. But for the rest of us that want our fitness to support a range of activities, that's a mistake. And there's a couple of places I want to go and I'm trying to keep it together in my, my little brain. So I want to talk about, yeah, programming four pathways is not really what you want to do. And well, I'll start there. And then yeah, circle me back to something. So, you know, we were talking before we clicked on the camera, there was a line I'm going to butcher a bit from uh, Greg Glassman years ago that he basically said, the human body is not so well understood that highly specific training modalities are, are as effective as we would hope. And yep. I think that plays well into what you just said, where somebody might say, okay, I'm going to program on Monday, I'm in the phosphor creatine pathway, Tuesday's all glycolytic, Thursday's oxidative, whatever it happens to be. The bit of a fool's errand, I agree with you, but what could lure you into thinking that's possible is some of the data that's out there on the internet. It may lead you astray. Yeah. So a simple search that I did of energy systems used for running, I found this, what energy systems are used from the 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, and it breaks down how much is aerobic or anaerobic. Well that data is not as rock solid as it seems and it's very modal specific it's just with running mm. and i remember speaking with somebody point. speaking with somebody who is a department head of an exercise science um at a particular university you just said the, the gentleman's name again dr jenkins was Correct, a, yeah. his name had a great conversation with dr jenkins a couple of years ago and i kind of threw this stuff at him since he was the department head and did this stuff for a living and i was like look is our thinking correct that the human body with some of these pathways and when exactly the transition happens from one to the other is not as well understood as most people would have us to believe. And he was like, absolutely. It's absolutely not as well understood. And then even most of the studies that were done, eh, they're not exactly ironclad to say the least. Mm. And then the other part of that, which is so important for CrossFit is there's almost zero that had been done with high intensity mixed modality training where you're gonna sprint yep. 400, do four squat cleans, walk in your hands for 10 meters. That, that just, it's not there. So yeah. trying to program, those, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I, just to piggyback on that. Yeah, if you look at a lot of those studies, they are so specific. It'll have one group of athletes, that's the control doing eight sets of eight on the leg press. And then another mm -hmm. group of athletes doing sets of 20 on the leg press and they'll compare those and then expect to draw some meaningful conclusion <laughs> about how right. people should train in the gym. And it's so specific as to be meaningless, frankly. And, and that's why even though it sounds simple, if you're designing some intelligent program that goes from short to medium to long, you're going to cover your bases. And one of the things we used to say is, look, we're talking about three metabolic pathways. And if there's now a fourth, or a fifth, or a sixth, it doesn't matter if they discover 100 metabolic pathways, because they're going to fall somewhere in short to medium and to long. And so if you're doing that nicely designed variance, you're going to cover your bases. And that's why, circling back to what we said at the beginning of the show, you can nuke this stuff and go as far down a rabbit hole as you want, but it may not yield as much benefit to what you're going to do the next day in the gym as one might think in just a purely academic setting. Absolutely, and, and that's one thing that is so interesting to me is that people wanna discard the largest data set out there, which is the fact that if it was so well-defined, what would guarantee the result that you were looking for, everybody would already be doing that thing and there would be no further need for training experimentation mm -hmm. or training uh, uh, variants. And that's not the case at all, you see coaches of all disciplines, not just CrossFit, but across the board, continuing to experiment with different methodologies, different variables, 
probably now more than ever as physical culture has exploded, as the access to seeing what other people are doing via the internet and social media has exploded. I think there's probably, I'd be very confident to say that there is more experimentation going on now in all realm of sport than ever in human history. And so if, you, if you're trying to make the claim that science has all of the answers currently for how to direct your training, well, that's patently not true. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would there be all this experimentation happening? Why would there be need for that if, if that was already predetermined? And it's yep. clearly not. So you just have to be careful sometimes putting the cart before the horse. I think it's easy to get into the mindset of, oh, I can read this abstract and that will be the, the guide to the best result. But you have to remember that coaching and experimentation has always been the leader in that relationship. Somebody has a group of athletes, they start doing something a little bit differently than the rest of how the sport trains. That group makes some great progress. All of a sudden, everybody's paying attention. Mm -hmm. The scientists come in behind that and say, let's figure out why this yields a better result. But that was a secondary effect. That was not what happened first. And then that person said, oh, I should train this way because there's been a, a well-documented case for it. It's the opposite. The experimentation happens in the gym with the coach, and then science follows and says, hmm, I wonder why. Science follows observation. And I, exactly. I think you hit a huge point that the experimentation is, I think, one of the other hidden weapons of the advancement of CrossFit is instead of you know, if you've got however many affiliates all around the world, however many people in their garage gyms all around the world at universities, you've got that many different minds tinkering, experimenting, trying to push the envelope. Well, 15,000 minds are going to get to the root of a problem a whole lot sooner than one or two. So that experimentation is absolutely mission critical. And Lord knows that I love tinkering with uh, programming for everybody else who likes to do it as well. Keep it going because that's what that's what optimizes everything. That's what develops lessons learned. That's what gets best practices. And that helps everybody out. So yeah, I think I think we were incorrect, Boz. We were chatting beforehand. We're like, this is going to be a really short. <laughs> That's Yeah, I was wrong. Super short episode. <laughs> How could it possibly go long? But somehow we made yeah. it. Yeah, I think so. But I, I want to land the plane just by circling back around. And at the risk of being redundant, just kind of landing the plane on the idea that we've got these three metabolic pathways. The fittest person is that who has the best capacity across all of them. And so what should our fitness program do? It should develop all of them. And it really is that simple. So that's the bedrock of what we're after here. Like Pat said, you can go down the rabbit hole if that's something of interest to you, but don't lose sight of the big signposts. 100%. Well, again, as always, thank you for uh, dropping some gems there, Boz. And like we say at the end of all these episodes, thanks for your support. If you're listening in an audio format, of course, we appreciate that. But what we would love everybody to do is go to the BTWB YouTube page, post some comments under this episode. You've heard what Boz and I think. That's great. But we want to know, what do you think? You know, what, what do you think about the metabolic pathways? Have you tinkered with anything that you think everybody else should know about that's really driving fitness forward in your community. Let's share that knowledge. Thanks, everybody. For Adrian Bosman, I'm Pat Sherwood, and we will see you next time.